TED Talk. It began as a conference for technology, entertainment and design, uh, but now it is any idea worth sharing. Uh, they're all talks that are 18 minutes or less, and the TED Ed Clubs is the educational branch they're developing, and uh, that's where students create their own TED Talk or TED-like talk. in our presentation today is the process that we followed to end up with the TED Talk or a TED-like talk at the end of this big long process. We're going to take you through um, generating ideas, building those ideas to deepen them and strengthen them, all the skills that the students need in order to successfully create a TED Talk, and then finally into um, some things you can do with sharing talks and some resources you can use for TED Talks. But I think the key that you that we want to point out is the value really came from the process and all the skills that were being used and practiced in the process, um, and, and not so much focus on the end product. One of the most powerful things about the TED Ed clubs and creating a TED-like talk is that we're valuing their stu a student experience. And an, an, an example that I like to share is a student, let's call her Lisa, and she was one of the last to pitch her talk ideas, possible talk ideas to the class. And she came to the class in our roundtable discussion and she said, I'm not good at anything. I don't have an idea worth sharing. And so the students started to question her, you know, what sports do you play? And Lisa said, I don't play a sport. They said, well, have you ever done any activities like guides or something like that? No. And then they said, well, what TV shows do you like to watch? We don't have TV. And they questioned, the questioning continued outside of our TED Ed time at, over the course of three or four days. And they kept asking our questions, your favorite food, your favorite color. They were really trying hard to brainstorm. And finally, someone said, well, what did you do in grade three in that social studies project that we did? And she said, I was a year in grade three. So they said, well, where were you? And she said, well, that was two schools ago. I was in Kitchener, then I, that was when I was in Mississauga, I think. And they said, well, how many schools have you been to? And Lisa, who was a grade five student, said, eight different schools. And they went, aha, you're an expert at moving and changing schools. That's what you should talk about. And Lisa shone. Like it made, it, to see Lisa's face light up and for us to validate her experience was very powerful. And, and another example of valuing that student voice is um, something we saw in Wellesley last year when we did the project. We have a fairly um, large population of the school who comes from a distinct culture, and rules are very important in that culture. Conformity is very important in that culture. And their geographic experience is really limited because as far as they can travel in a horse and buggy. Um, and something that came out of this project was just giving them a chance to pick something that's important to them and having that voice to share something that was important to them. So one example of that is just the fact that these students are traveling by horse and buggy, a lot slower than most of us who are flying down the roads in our cars. And just something that really was important to them from a grade three perspective from their life was the litter on the sides of the road. So giving them that voice to share how that impacts them, why that was important to their lives was really a valuable experience for them. So we started by discussing what is an idea worth spreading. We had to figure out what is an idea worth spreading. And we decided that it's a message that is important to each student, something that they want, a message that they want heard. A message that they want to share and it's something that makes their home their school their community their world a better place so once we had that figured out we started brainstorming some possible ideas things that kids are passionate about we ended up sending this anchor chart home with students along with a note to parents explaining what our project was all about and we asked parents to help their child brainstorm some ideas, some things that they're passionate about. And we also ask parents to discuss reasons why that is an important topic, and why that is an idea worth spreading. So that when they came back to school, they had a starting point, some place to start writing. We pulled obviously a bunch of texts from our library. We looked at a variety of persuasive texts. We looked at some techniques that authors use to persuade people. We pulled a bunch of 
books from our library that tell the stories of children doing great things around the world. And one quote um, from this book, Our Earth, How Kids Are Saving the Planet, I had up in my classroom and it goes like this. If many little people in many little places do many little things, they can change the face of the earth. And I think this was, an, this was a great quote to use because we talked about the fact it doesn't have to be a big, huge, global idea. It doesn't have to be kids raising um, money to build a well in Africa. It can be um, a little thing. And it doesn't have to be a big, huge idea. So that was helpful for a lot of kids to understand that. As Angie mentioned, the talk at home was really, really important to the kids, um, generating ideas, but also deepening their ideas. Um, because of that, from a teacher perspective, we couldn't really mark the content of the talks because there was a lot of conversation going on at home. So what we looked at as far as an assessment piece for this project was the oral communication, which really lends itself to that. So there, what we have up there on the screen is just an example of what our learning goal and success criteria look like. Obviously that was for grade three, so depending on your grade it might look a lot different. But I think just remembering that we were looking at the oral piece as opposed to the content of the talks, just because the amount of home uh, school connection that was going on. So throughout this project, we obviously had a bunch of mini lessons that we worked through with the students. And we pulled our mini lessons from a variety of different resources. I'm sure you all have your favorite resources that you like to use um, to get ideas for, for your lessons. But we focused, our, our mini lessons we focused on persuasive techniques, generating ideas, bold beginnings, word choice, and revision. And it's important to note that we um, started this project in April. So the kids had a whole year of um, working on generating ideas for the beginnings. These weren't, this wasn't new to them, but it was kind of a neat way that they could take what they had learned throughout the year and put it together in this final project. Um, the GAF accounts, our Google Apps, were very valuable because students created their talks in their Google Documents and then they shared them with not only their own teacher but other teachers at the school to gather feedback and with each other as well. Um, it's also helpful because you can research and uh, find copyright-free images and have them referenced appropriately. Uh, for their final presentations, we used Google Slides so that it was quite complete and they could basically work from work on their talk any place where there's an internet connection. Uh, I included some TED-Ed hashtags. They're quite um, active on the web if you wanted to begin to follow them on Twitter or something like that, or their website's excellent resources. Uh, on the left screenshot there, there's an example of the sort of, co uh, the sort of feedback and you can see how many times a student with the blue icon has gone back and responded to uh, ideas given by classmates and has further developed his talk. Um, I also want to mention that if you do decide to do a formal TED-Ed club, they hold TED-Ed Connect Weeks and that's where you have a web chat with other TED-Ed clubs from around the world. I think that's quite valuable because it gives them a sense that the audience is greater than their own classroom and they're greater than each other. And uh, that's obviously really motivating and, and, and up the um, We recommend creating your own rubric with uh, your class depending on what your learning goal and success criteria are. But that's just an example. We sort of wanted to share with you all that we had so that you would have some a starting point. Um, the handouts and the URL, this slideshow will continue to be available to you. Uh, tips and tricks. Um, I recommend getting an idea that they can talk about for a decent amount of time. So something <coughs> that they can't just easily research on Google and find out the answers in five minutes. But perhaps um, if they can collect their own data, that's more valuable. So an example of that would be a student that did a talk on how children misuse the word starving when they say I'm starving and what does that really mean. And to anchor that and to gather some data, she actually surveyed our junior division and asked them how much they had in their lunch pails that day and if they had had enough to eat, if, or if they had enough to eat, uh, going on throughout the entire day. And the results were quite shocking and it actually uh, got our snack program running faster. Another example would be the little girl at the beginning where she talked about saying no to the toy, to the fast food toy. 
um, she ran the local fast food restaurant and found out with the pay place that they sold 1,200 Happy Meals a week. And then so she went to grade eight, we went to grade eight math class and we said, how can we put this in perspective? We only know numbers up to 1,000, we're dealing with numbers up to 1,000. And so they did the math for us and they worked out that that would fill, just that like one McDonald's would fill the classroom with toys in six months. So that gave her a, a, some great things to talk about and, and anchored those numbers for her. And then she did a survey in, Google, in the Google Forms about how many children had used the, had actually got a fast food toy and how long they had used it for. And it was powerful. Um, it can be chaotic because everyone's researching a different topic and usually 10 are ready to go, 10 students, and then you've got 15, that it takes time to find that idea that they're actually passionate about and an idea that's worth sharing with others. And then the process can be daunting. So there's an example of how you could deal with that. Is the first column is stuff I need help. The next column is I'm continuing to work and edit on my talk. And the last column is I'd love some feedback. So then the small group goes out, they, they share with each other, they film each other on iPads, they get feedback from each other and also from the iPad as they rewatch their talk. If you do decide to do a formal TED Ed Club, that's the place to go to their website. Uh, you do have to apply early and then you have a face-to-face -face web chat if they want to see that you're a real teacher and answer any of your questions. But it is great resources. That's a screenshot of all the downloads you get. You get student workbooks, you get 13 clear lessons, um, you get examples of TED Talks that you can share with your class. It, it's worthwhile. There's just a few of the, the 13 lessons. And uh, here's an example um, of, they create a video for each of the lessons as well, and it just to show you how, how, the quality of the lessons. TED speakers are known for channeling their passions. In your first TED Ed Club meeting, watch a few speakers discuss their passions. What's your passion? What thoughts or questions make your heart beat faster? What are the unanswered questions you want to discover? Discuss the passions, ideas, and challenges that sparked your curiosity. My dream was to become a Chinese opera singer. I want us all to become evolutionary, renegade, gang, against the guard. I believe this passion is that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it. Or rather, we get educated out of it. I wish for... Yeah, so it's quality, it's great resources. Um, building class culture is crucial, and having those class meetings, I recommend even watching the little uh, video called Austin the Butterfly, if you haven't seen that. It's a, it's a really great example of effective feedback. Um, Always watch and preview, another tip is watch and preview the TED Talks first. They're not always appropriate, their audience is often adults. Uh, even the ones they recommend in the lessons, because the lessons are designed for 8 to 18 year olds. Um, we do, we've just begun a Google Classroom for TED Ed uh, clubs at our board. So it's a place where you can go and ask questions, perhaps even connect to other clubs in our board. And um, there's an innovation project there that I'd love some help with. Uh, the TED Ed Club YouTube channel is another place that I'd stop by if you're interested in doing these talks because there's hundreds of student exemplars. They upload many of the TED Ed Club talks there. So it is a, there's a good chance that your, your students would be featured there and would be, um, their, their talk would be shared with the world. Here's uh, an example from a student in a grade 5 classroom, Aisha. She was actually featured on the TED Ed blog. And the talk's quite amazing, as you'll see in a moment. Um, one thing I'd like you to notice is that she doesn't just completely cover the topic of hexadactyly. It's not like an information report on everything about this topic. Rather, her, she's got this main idea that flows throughout the entire talk. Her idea worth sh sharing is actually embrace our differences. It makes the world a better place. We all have ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, two ears, and one nose. Make a wish. If you could have two extra of one body part, what would it be? Four eyes so you could actually relax at the back of your head? Double ears so you could hear all the things people ever say about you? Or two noses so you could smell dinner from a kilometer away? Well, I didn't have to make a wish because I was born with twelve fingers. I'm a hexadactyl because if you're born
one with six fingers and six toes, it's called hexadactyly. If you're one with more than five fingers or toes in general, it's called polydactyly. So that means if you are born with seven fingers, like my dad, it isn't called hexadactyly, it's called polydactyly. Having six fingers never really bothered me because they cut my extra fingers off so short. The only time it's been hard is when I live with my cousins who are scared of going to contaminate them. Hexadactyly is not contagious. Well, in a way, it kind of can be. It can be inherited. It can run in your genes. Like me, it runs in my genes. My dad also had hexadactyly. He passed it back down to me. By the way, I'm not talking about this type of genes, of course. I'm talking about genetic genes. Genetic genes is when something is passed from parent to child. Just like I guess 12 said, I'm not sure. They must be a little confused. Also, if you let a former queen of England have hexadactyly on my hand, which means hex people with hexadactyly are royal, uh, Albert Einstein had Asperger's and he was a genius. Bella Thorne from Shake It Up is dyslexic and she's an amazing dancer and singer. Pierre Curie is a dyslexic physicist and he won a Nobel Prize. My point in all of this is that with learning disabilities or birth defects, you can still do amazing things. You can still be amazing. You want to hear something really amazing? When I was researching all these things to fit in my talk, when I searched people with dyslexia, the website was called People with the Gift of Dyslexia. They refer to it as a gift, and you should take not just the dys dyslexia, of course, but anything different about yourself. See it as a gift, the most unique gift of all, the gift that not all people are able to receive when you can't buy in stores. And you should use that gift. Use it to the most of its ability, and re-gifting isn't that cool anyway, so yeah. A lot of it. Doesn't that, isn't she amazing? Doesn't she sell it? Her passion is obvious. Her depth of knowledge is obvious. And um, uh, 13 minutes uh, that she memorized and uh, largely done at home as well, I might add. Yeah. So I think we've probably covered most of what's on the slide. I'll let the slide speak for itself. Um, outcomes that we've seen from the TEDx talk. Maybe if I wanted to highlight one thing, it's just the fact that the, the important part is the process and all these skills that the students are able to apply and practice in a um, in their project that hopefully really matters to them, and then hopefully see those skills then um, connected in, in in their work throughout the year rather than just in this one instance. And that's all we have.